Good morning. My name is Allison Kaplan. I'm Director of Education here at the National First Ladies Library in Canton, Ohio, where I actually am this morning, which is really exciting to me. Um, so hopefully you can all hear me. Um, we are broadcasting on Zoom to our registered attendees this morning, but we are also on Facebook Live. And I'm seeing myself, which is good news. Um, and I'm seeing people in the chat, so that is good news. Um, for housekeeping purposes, please know that we will be recording this and we are broadcasting it live. Um, it will also be posted later today or tomorrow onto our YouTube page. So if you didn't make it or you break in later or you want to share it with someone, please do um, check back. The other thing that I want to mention is the National First Ladies Library is now open to the public um, with three really amazing exhibitions. Um, one is about First Ladies on the Campaign Trail, one is about women's suffrage, and the third um, greatly applies to today's discussion because it involves women who have run for um, office of the President of the United States. So we're very excited to kick off these exhibitions with a talk this morning. Um, by Dr. Judith Dan. But before I turn things over to Dr. Dan, I want to mention some of the other virtual events that are coming up over the next few weeks so you can join us again. So on July 15th, you can tune in to the National Park Service, um, National First Ladies Library Historic Site page and see the premiere of a talk on July 15th at 10 a.m by Chris Wilkinson, who is the site manager here. So he will be speaking about Louisa Adams' journey, which should be really amazing. So please um, tune in to the National Park Service's Facebook page for First Lady's historic site if you're interested in seeing that talk, which will debut on July 15th. On July 23rd, we will have another legacy lecture by our very own Michelle Gilliam, who will be speaking on First Ladies and the Thorny Road to Suffrage. So if you wanted to know what First Ladies were thinking about as um, women across the country struggled for the passage of the 19th Amendment and the right to vote, uh, tune in on July 23rd at noon, that will be on our Facebook page as well as Zoom, so you can go on our Eventbrite site and register for that as well. Um, and then it looks like Michelle is joining us right now too. So um, Michelle is here Hi. and on the screen. Um, so that is uh, the last legacy lecture on the books for right now until, the, until August. And then um, August 27th, we have a book club meeting um, and we are reading Never Caught by Erica Armstrong Dunbar. So that should be really, really exciting. Um, it is the story of um, Ona Judge, who was um, George Washington and Martha Washington's um, enslaved woman who ran away um, and was never caught. So I'm really excited about that book. I think it should be a really interesting and pertinent discussion. So now that we've talked about all of the upcoming things, I am going to mention, um, I'm going to introduce our speaker, then Michelle and I are going to turn off our cameras and, um, and we will turn it over to Judith Dan, who will begin her um, presentation. So I absolutely love the um, title of this presentation, Victoria Woodhall, Queen Victoria or Satan. Um, so that is the title of Dr. Dan's talk. She is a professor of ancient history and lead instructor in the classics in humanities department in Columbus State Community College. She received her BA in classics from Miami University and her master's and PhD in ancient history from the Ohio State University. Her areas of specialty include comparative religions, mythology, ancient art, and archaeology. During graduate school, she worked as a staff member at the US OSU excavations at Izmia, Greece, where a Roman bathhouse is being excavated. She is also a member of the Board of Trustees at Robbins Hunter Museum in Granville, Ohio, which boasts the only memorial to Victoria Woodhall in the United States. 
For years, Judith has been researching Woodhull's life, and she lives in Homer, Ohio, um, Victoria Woodhull's birthplace with her husband and three children. So with that, I'm going to turn my camera off and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Dan. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. So I guess I'm going to try to pull up my PowerPoint. And hopefully that works. Well, first I have to say hello to everyone. Thank you so much for joining and to those who will hopefully be listening to this recorded later. I am just humbled uh, beyond measure uh, to be part of this. And I am so, so grateful that Victoria is being included uh, in this entire series. Um, it's my honor to be able to speak about one of the most overlooked and unsung heroes in American history. And here she is. Her name is Victoria California Claflin Woodhull Blood Martin. Those are all of her names or Queen Victoria or Mrs. Satan. And we're gonna look at that and see what that's all about. I came to know Victoria when I moved to Homer, Ohio about 20 years ago with my husband. Um, this is her birthplace and I, I had no idea that she even existed. And I thought, well, why, why would I not know about her? She was one of the most famous women of her time. She was a true social mover shaker. Um, and unfortunately she has been written out of history. Um, uh, and so that's one of the things I kind of want to look at. Why would this happen? She uh, not only was she one of the most famous women, but uh, we had another sect of society who saw her uh, and, and vilified her. She was known as the scandalous Victoria. She was known as a harlot, a polygamist, a drug user, a prostitute. She was called the queen of the prostitutes, queen of the free lovers, and finally, of course, Miss Satan. We're going to be looking at those. None of these obviously are true. Um, through all of this vilification, she was actually one of the most powerful advocates, um, social advocates, an advocate of women, children, and society as a whole. I, um, I, it's very interesting. She was a rather Renaissance woman. Um, so what was it? Who was she? And what happened? What I hope you will find when you listen to this is that a lot of this might sound very familiar to you. Issues that we're still grappling with. Um, and it's my take on Victoria's life and her voice is that we need to listen to her. We need to hear her voice as a guide uh, through some of our own struggles. Why reinvent the wheel? So as a Renaissance woman, she was a politician, a financier, a psychologist, a quote unquote doctor. Uh, she was a journalist and she was a self-proclaimed uh, social agitator for the welfare of humanity. Uh, she absolutely criticized the old guard. She criticized the old school, the wealthy and government. And um, she's often known for her political campaign for presidency and also that she stood up for women's suffrage. But really, Victoria was um, a, uh, a leader in the ERA movement. Um, and so I think that's so important and she should really come back into the national conversation. I also can see her as a bit Forrest Gumpish. Uh, and you will see this as we go. She seemed to have her hand in everything. She seemed to know all the big movers and shakers and have some connection to them. Uh, when I did research in her archives, I was just finding letters from Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, all of these greats, um, and then little comments about, say, what Walt Whitman said. So she really was a bit of Forrest Gumpus, but she deserved every, every bit of it. Um, what I'm showing you here is I found her daughter, Zula Woodhull, had made a scrapbook about her mother. And she noted in the front, this was her only, um, only quote in the front of this book, it was a brave sower of seeds. And I just can't get past this. I think this is so, 
so true. Um, she definitely sowed a lot of seeds and we should all be thankful for that. So who was she? She was born right here in Homer, Ohio. I don't know how many of you know where Homer is. It's, it really is a crossroads. Uh, it was on the frontier at the time. So it really was kind of a backwater place. She was born September 23rd, 1838. Uh, she was born into a rather poor family as many of them were at the time. It was a very difficult life here on the frontier. Her father is Reuben Buckman Claflin, or Buck, as he's known. And I'm going to be constantly referring back to the biographies that are out there about Victoria. And I have to caution every one of you, if you want to go and get a biography of her, take every bit of it with a grain of salt. Uh, my colleague and I are in the process of doing a like wiping away all of these biographies and we're going back to the primary sources and we're seeing exactly um, who she was and let's get the truth out there. Well, Buck does not fare much better in history. He was, um, I found a quote that says he was a one-eyed, one-man crime spree. I'm not sure uh, where that came from. Um, some people really villainized him and in some of the books that are out show him as a sexual abuser of his children and there is just nothing true about that at all. So in all of our research books, reputation is rising just as much as Victoria's is. We know that Buck and Victoria had a very close relationship throughout his entire life. And we have a number of very, very touching letters and a poem that he actually wrote to his beloved daughter, uh, Victoria. So we've got to look at Buck in a little different light. Her, uh, Victoria's mother was Roxana Hummel Claflin. Uh, now her reputation isn't getting much better. <laughs> As a matter of fact, we see that poor Roxana really was crippled uh, with mental illness and the family understood that. And Roxana caused quite a number of problems for her daughters or for her entire family. Um, Victoria was one of 10 children of the Claflins, three of whom died very young or in infancy. Um, we know that one of these uh, children was also mentally ill, a sister of, of Victoria's. Another one will die very young of addiction, alcohol and drug addiction. And it was a really sad tale um, for Victoria. So she understood mental illness. She understood um, the problem of addiction, which again is uh, very pertinent to our uh, times today. Another one of her sisters will become her close confidant and they will do everything together. Her name is Tennessee Celeste Claflin. Uh, she will later in life be known as Tenny. Um, she will also be very cleverly Tenny C with a capital C like Tennessee or Tennessee Celeste. Uh, Tenny was uh, the younger sister. She was where both of these women were beautiful and intelligent. Uh, Tennessee was very much um, uh, very voluminous. She was uh, stunning. She was truly a beauty, but as we're finding out, she is really the brains behind all of the business ventures um, of the Claflin sisters. Uh, Victoria would be their mouthpiece. So when they were living in Homer, one of the great stories or legends that arises around Victoria's childhood is this. This is a, a Native American burial mound that sits today right behind Homer Public Library, which I'm also a board member and we're very proud of both Victoria and Tennessee. Um, but this burial mound was there obviously when Victoria lived in Homer. And it is said that she would go up to the top of this mound and she would tell stories to the neighborhood children, Bible stories. And so the parents would be happy with that. But even as a young child, Victoria was public speaker par excellence. And as a young child, she could sense the restlessness of her audience. And ultimately when she sensed this restlessness, she would switch stories and start telling Indian tales. How awesome is that? So 
I don't know how accurate this is, but it sure is a really neat story uh, to think about. So she was definitely a public speaker at a very early age. Um, her family was known to have been very poor. They were just trying to survive. Um, it was hard times in the 1840s and 50s, especially on the frontier. One of the other interesting characteristics about Victoria and also Tennessee are that they were mediums. Um, they will not join the spiritualist movement for years later, but they truly believed that they could commune with the spirits. And um, Victoria says that she would often commune with her dead sisters when they would come to her in spirit to play. Um, one of the, this is probably the earliest image that I can find of Victoria. Obviously there are not many when she was young, but she is a stunning beauty. She claims that she had a spirit guide with her and she wouldn't find out who he was until years later, until she was in her thirties. And, um, but it was Demosthenes. Now Demosthenes, this is kind of my claim to fame because I'm a classicist. He was a fourth century BC Athenian order. He was very famous for his, uh, what's called the Philippics. They were, were orations against King Philip of Macedon telling the Athenians, hey, you guys, really, you gotta pay attention to what's going on here. So it's very interesting that she would choose or that this spirit chose Victoria, whichever way you wanna look at it, of an orator being a spiritual guide to another orator because Victoria will be one of the greatest speakers in America. She toured all over the country. Um, but she claims to have seen Demosthenes in Homer. So I kind of like that, that, that Demosthenes has visited Homer where I live. Uh, we know the family was here until the very early 1850s, and they will eventually move from Homer and go to Mount Gilead, which is just north of uh, uh, Homer. Again, legend arises about this, that Buck burned down his mill. They had a mill here in Homer and supposedly he the story was that he burnt it down and then tried to get the insurance money out of it um, but from all of our research my colleague and I is that never happened and as a matter of fact when he sold the mill all the buildings were still standing so we're not quite sure where that came in but part of that legend is that people thought ugh, these Claflins were so horrible and they booted them out of Homer which Maybe some people in Homer didn't like the Claflins, but for the most part, that's not true at all. Uh, they went to uh, the family ultimately, one by one, meets up in Mount Gilead where Victoria, and this was around the age of 14 that she left Homer, uh, she meets Canning Woodhull and she will marry him. He was, this is 1853. Um, he was 10 years her senior and he claimed that he was a doctor. Of course, a lot of people claim they were a doctor at the time, including Victoria. Uh, well, they will ultimately have a tiny family, as you can see here, one son and one daughter. And the year following their marriage, Byron Woodhull, her son was born. So it was a very hard time for Victoria. Canning was known to have indulged in drink quite a lot, um, potentially gone to houses of ill repute, as she would say. And the worst of all of the catastrophes was that Byron was born with some sort of um, mental handicap. And we're not quite sure what it was. It obviously wasn't Downs by the pictures we have of him, but he never spoke um, he really was a child and she says years later when he was about 19 years old, she says he's just a tiny baby that walks around basically, um, but he was a sweet, sweet boy and um, Victoria, this, this is one of the things, all the things Victoria did, this alone is where I'm most impressed by her character. She refused to institutionalize him. He was kept with the family. He was always with family, whether it be herself, her husband, a cousin, always. So I just have the utmost respect uh, for her in dealing with her beloved son. Um, these were hard times for her. It was a hard marriage. It wasn't what she thought it would be. They were desperately poor and Canning didn't wasn't able to uphold the family. So the family, this very young family, uh, goes to San Francisco and Victoria thought she would try her hand at raising 
<clears throat> funds for the family. Um, for a very short time, she was a cigar girl, supposedly. She then turned to being a seamstress for the stage, for an actress, very famous actress. And ultimately, she will join her on stage. Um, so she was a bit of an amateur actress. But it was there that then she was kind of called back by the spirit of her sister and she returned and the family would be uh, reunited. They came back and in 1861, her daughter Zulu Maud was born. Um, I, we've also seen it Zula Maud. Um, but I, I have to say at this point, there are no direct descendants of Victoria Woodhull. Obviously, Byron did not have children and Zulu never married, and nor did she have children. So if you ever hear anybody say that they're a direct descendant of Victoria, that's absolutely incorrect. Um, at this time, we know that the entire Claflin family had a bit of a um, traveling business venture. They were selling elixirs and um, as they would say, snake oils. They were, they called themselves magnetic doctors. Victoria and mostly Tenny were being employed as mediums, $1 per reading. And we know that they tour the country with their craft. Um, again, I have to reiterate that it was not a happy marriage between Victoria and Canning, but they did stay together in whatever sense you could say. They were always together and in touch for his whole life until he passed away at a very early age. Um, it seems that there was really more than likely genuine affection between the two. His addictions and troubles were always a sore spot between them. But we also know that it was his love of the children that kept him around and that, that Victoria allowed him to stay around. She did ultimately divorce Canning. And when she was in St. Louis, um, uh, she was plying her wares as a medium and a spiritualist. She ended up meeting another man and she married him. This is Colonel James Blood. He was a union hero in the Civil War. He was a fellow spiritualist and the two of them um, became fast, a fast item and will ultimately get married. It's very complicated though. They got married several times, potentially divorced several times, um, but nonetheless, he was her husband, at least physically, if not in name. He will literally be her intellectual partner uh, in her adult life and her adult career here in the United States. Unfortunately, though, he was not a physical partner, even though he was her husband. We know um, my colleague has uh, has acquired his pension records. And it shows that Colonel James Blood was severely, severe, severely injured in a number of ways, making even the slightest exertion uh, dangerous and he would pass out. So um, there's Victorian Bloods was more of a spiritual connection. Let's just say that. So this is an, these are two images of Tenny C, as you see her here. She and Victoria were, of course, these scandalous women actually speaking out about things. And they cut their hair short. They shingled it. Oh, my goodness. They were both also known to have dressed rather manly, very tailored looking. Um, one might say that they were wearing power suits at the time. Here's Victoria and Tenny. So the two of them will go on their uh, tours, magnetic healing tours, but they will also end up along with Colonel Blood. The three of them will end up in New York City, this threesome in 1868. And unfortunately for Victoria, most of their family followed them everywhere they went. <laughs> they just never could get away from some of those members of the family that they wished they could. Um, when they were in New York, they were introduced to none other. Here's another image of both of them with their hair cut shingled. Um, Victoria's on the left, Tenny, what a beauty, is on the right. They befriended this man, Cornelius Vanderbilt, the Cornelius Vanderbilt. He also was a spiritualist, and that's kind of what made the connection. Victoria will end up being Vanderbilt's almost personal medium. And Tenny 
would be his personal confidant. We know that there was more than likely an affair between the very young Tenney Claflin and Cornelius Vanderbilt. Um, but Victoria would kind of help him, maybe one would call it insider trading, find information um, from other people about stocks and things going on in um, the marketplace. And of course, then she said the spirits would tell her, well, Vanderbilt was able to then translate that into a massive windfall. While these two women were here uh, and with their connection to Vanderbilt, they amassed a fortune. They came to New York rather poor and they will end up earning around, I've seen the number around $700,000 within seven months in 1870. I am not a math whiz, but my husband is, and he um, has figured it out. That would be about the equivalency of $13 million that they made in seven months time. They ended up getting a mansion on Murray Hill. Wow, well, they're self-made millionaires, really. This is an image of Victoria with one of her paintings. Victoria and Tenney were known to have had arguably the largest art collection in the United States when they were in their um, lucrative years. And we have really have no idea what pieces were in this collection and we have no idea what happened to the collection, which is really a tragedy I see. Um, but with this money, what they did is they chose to make more money and they started a stock brokerage firm. Victoria and Tenney were the first women stockbrokers on Wall Street. They opened their stock brokerage early in the year of 1870, and they broke into this man's world, and they proved themselves. What I'm showing you here is a um, it's a magazine, a men's gentleman's magazine called The Day's Doings. And it talked about the opening of this crazy idea that women could be stockbrokers on Wall Street. Their office was actually on Broad Street, but that's just around the corner from Wall Street. They were definitely in the financial district. And they opened their stock brokerage firm. The newspapers covered it. There were thousands of people thronging the streets to see this crazy idea of these women. Um, what's rather disturbing to me is that the newspapers would just go into this long description of what they were wearing, uh, their clothes, uh, which brings me to this. Uh, this is in a um, Manhattan Museum of Finance. They have made a recreation of the dress that Victoria had worn and Victoria and Tenney, they were matching. Uh, the day they opened their stock brokerage firm. This dress was part of a women in finance exhibit and it now is on loan to the Robbins Hunter Museum in Granville, Ohio. So we've made a whole exhibit around it. So if you're ever in Granville, you've got to come to the wonderful Robbins Hunter Museum and see this dress, it's, it's stunning. So they broke into this world. I have to show you some of the um, cartoons that were put in the paper, the bewitching brokers, I think it's really interesting if this is how they were seen to have gathered up their clientele by grabbing them and hauling them off. This is another one, mesmerism in Wall Street. <laughs> so this must be obviously how it was done and Commodore Vanderbilt, but they're not saying all the letters in his name. That must be why this gentleman has befriended these two um, women from the other side of the tracks. Here's another one, female brokers securing a customer. It's obviously Victorian Tenney, and that is obviously Cornelius Vanderbilt. Uh, several other things I think is just so funny. Victorian Tenney driving the bulls on Wall Street. Um, this is a little creepy. They look like bobbleheads, but there's Victoria on the left and Tenney on the right uh, with their brokerage firm. Now, this is not Victoria, but I'm sorry, I can't see anything but. Uh, this is the bull with this young girl just standing so powerfully and courageously. And uh, hopefully from here on out, you will never see that as anything other than Victoria as well. Uh, she literally took on the bulls of Wall Street uh, head on. So, wow, 
They're now um, business successes. And this is where their life in New York City was really remarkable. Uh, they, uh, Victoria literally started a salon, one could say. She had people of high quality thinkers, educators, businessmen coming to her place and discussing issues. It really was a think tank. So you can't just say that Victoria was um, accidentally put into this position and uh, thrust into the spotlight. I wanna show you some examples of some of the people uh, that she would have come to her house and would have conversations with. Um, but I do wanna show this first. After they had started their brokerage firm, they also started a newspaper publishing company called the Woodhull and Claflin's Weekly. Notice what the byline is, progress, free thought, untrammeled lives. They dealt with very difficult and serious issues. Um, and they were trying for social change. Here's another image of their newspaper. Here's some of them. Upper left corner, that is Stephen Pearl Andrews, who was very influential to Victoria about his social ideas of reform. White Law Reed was the editor of the Tribune. Orville Grant was uh, President Ulysses S. Grant's brother. And we know that they were friends with, with Grant's father, actually. Uh, the next man over is General Frederick Tracy Dent, who was a brother-in-law of the president. General Benjamin Butler was another union general, and he also became a congressman who would support Victoria later on. Governor George Hahn was uh, the union governor of Louisiana. William Orton, president of Western Union Telegraph Company. As you can see, these are big wigs. These are movers and shakers. I counted there were three governors, five company presidents, four generals, one senator, and one judge, at least. Those are the men. What about the women? Wow. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, upper left-hand corner. Susan B. Anthony. Uh, there are letters in Victoria's archives from both of these women. They were friends. Uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton remained friends with Victoria for years. Upper right corner, Paulina Wright Davis, another uh, giant of the women's suffrage movement. Isabella Beecher Hooker coming down to the right. She was the uh, half sister of Henry Ward Beecher that we will get to and also a lifelong friend. And finally, uh, another impressive one, Bella Lockwood, attorney. And she also made a presidential bid uh, in 1884 and 88. So this is what the think tank was. Victoria was a self-made woman, self-educated woman and a tremendous thinker. At one point in this year, we know that Victoria tried to vote. She and four of her friends and they were stopped cold. Um, and the, the guards were saying, oh, you know, ladies, you aren't allowed to vote. And she said, well, of course I am. And she pulled out her pocket constitution, which she always carried with her. Her argument was the 14th Amendment says that every person born in the United States is a U.S. citizen. And the 15th Amendment said every U.S. citizen has the right to vote. And she says it doesn't delineate sex. So we already have the right to vote. Um, so that's very interesting. Well, one when she's arguing with the guards, one of her friends slipped a vote in and the newspaper article that talks about this said, and oh, they fished it out and said, oh, look who she voted for. Of course, see, this is why we don't want women to vote. They don't know who they're voting for. Uh, we know that she trumped all of these uh, women in the suffrage movement by being the first to speak before Congress. She spoke before the Judiciary Committee January 11th, 1871. She saw um, the country on the brink of revolution. Hmm, that's very interesting. She wanted constitutional equality and she spoke about her constitutional right that it was not delineated for sex. The, the Congress was very impressed by Mrs. Woodhull's memorial as it was called. And they, says, they said, wow, she did a great job, but we're gonna just keep it the way it is. So it fell flat. It didn't do much. We also see Elizabeth Cady Stanton uh, behind her. And Tenny is also beside her. And there they are. So these are friends. They actually were friends. They were shooting for the same thing. Ultimately, there will be a break between these because um, Victoria wanted more than just the vote. She wanted everything. She wanted equality completely across the board. So what we get to now is, now what? She is wealthy, she is now famous. Let's run for president. 
she announces her candidacy um, and her, she said the platform that is to succeed in the coming election must enunciate the general principles of enlightened justice and economy. We need to know she was an intellectual. Um, so here she is, this is signature and future presidentess. So I think when we get a woman president, this is what she needs to be called in honor of Victoria, don't you think so? Her running mate was Frederick Douglass, none other than Frederick Douglass. Now, Victoria was nominated by the Equal Rights Party. She didn't think the Democrats or the Republicans were doing anything to help women. So she left and went to the Equal Rights Party. She was the Equal Rights Party um, spokesperson for the oppressed sex and Frederick Douglass for the oppressed race. Now, unfortunately, Frederick Douglass never acknowledged his nomination but he never denied it either. We do know that he canvassed quite vociferously for their opponent, Ulysses S. Grant. Now, this is where I think it's interesting um, that my colleague and I have seen that um, Grant was friends with Victoria. They were all friends. He knew what was going on. She knew what was going on. She probably knew she would never make it, but as she says, she was trying to get the word out to make people think. And Ulysses S. Grant was helping her in a way for that. Well, he obviously won the election. I wanted to tell you some of the platforms upon which she ran because they're very interesting. And she was a woman ahead of her time. Um, she wanted complete prison reform. Very interesting about that. She thought saw no value in the punishment, the penal system as it stood, and she particularly wanted to help the families of those incarcerated. Um, she wanted internal organization of our system. She wanted the adoption of a better means to care for the helpless and the indigent. So she was definitely for some welfare type system. Um, she wanted to establish strictly neutral and reciprocal relations with all foreign powers who you all unite to better the condition of the productive class. She's actually seen as the forerunner of the League of Nations. Uh, the adoption of such principles, she says, will be that the class of true wealth um, is recognized in the working class. Uh, and she she wanted this the basis of government to be on enlightenment and education, not the imaginary benefit of mankind, as she says. So what happened to her in her presidential bid? Uh, she was a phenomenally popular speaker. She went across the United States speaking sometimes to thousands of people at a time on her social theories and um, reform. Well, this is where the problem comes in. She would give a speech one night to the cheers and adulation of thousands. And then the next day, the newspapers would come out with something like this. They would vilify her. This is a cartoon by the political cartoonist Thomas Nast, where we get our term nasty from. He called her Mrs. Satan, gave her wings with horns on her head be saved by free love. Victoria felt very strongly about the um, reform of the institution of marriage as it stood because she saw so many women who suffered and were literally murdered by the abuse of their husbands. She says she was very monogamous. She claims that over and over again. She was married three times, um, but she was monogamous for the most part. Uh, with them, but she just saw that the institution of marriage needed to be changed. Well, that's where it really got her. So she was called Mrs. Satan. Her mother, here's the mental illness factor. Her mother dragged Victoria and her husband, Colonel Blood, into court saying that she, this man had, had denied her the affections of her daughter. And it pretty much started the downhill slide. The thing that really got her um, is a scandal with Henry Ward Beecher, one of the, the greatest um, ministers in the Northeast. And we know him very famously by his sister, Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Henry Ward Beecher was known to have been a philanderer. Victoria knew that. Susan B. Anthony knew it. Elizabeth Cady Stanton knew it. Everyone was talking about it. Um, he had been in a torrid affair with the wife of Victoria's 
friend. And yet he was unwilling to stand behind the banner of free love and to make social reform. And Victoria basically thought he was a fraud standing in the pulpit and she outed him in her paper. It became the Beecher Tilton scandal. It was huge. Um, we see here, oh my gosh, somebody's sitting on his lap. Um, it became a massive trial, months long. You can even go and, and watch this courtroom. But this is what was so dangerous, as well as at the same time, in the same newspaper, Victoria called out a man named Chalice, who had been um, pompously bragging about the fact that he got two very young girls inebriated and he accosted them. And as Victoria said, those two young ladies will never be the same. So here's the Me Too movement coming in. She outed him as well. She needed to be stopped. Um, they needed to shut her up. And this was just the man to do it. Self-proclaimed moralist Anthony Comstock um, caught her. Actually, um, he did it himself, pulled her in to um, mailing some of her newspapers that had this scandalous stuff in it. And she was arrested days, just days before the presidential elect, election by federal authorities on um, passing obscene material through the mail. She, her sister, Tenny and Blood will all spend time in Ludlow jail. Ultimately, they will be acquitted on a very small technicality, but it basically ruined her. Um, Harriet Beecher Stowe detested her, Victoria, all of her life and even made her into a character in one of her novels, My Wife and I, and she's obviously Audacia Danger Eyes. You, you can't not see Victoria Woodhull in that. Well, things were going very well in the United States. She did see a time that things, people were starting to support her, but all in all, uh, she left she left the United States for England in 1877, continued speaking. And at one of these talks, she met her future and final husband, John Biddulph Martin, who had been a fan of hers and he was a wealthy banker. So she starts from poverty, rises to fame and wealth, crashes and burns, moves to England, rises again. And as I say, she crashes and burns after that because no one remembers her. Uh, this is Tenny. The whole family will, most of the family will move to England. Tenny will land even softer. She married a count and um, she will become very, very wealthy. Victoria will continue her humanitarian efforts, started a new paper, The Humanitarian. Um, she was very progressive in her ideas. She loved cars. She loved planes, um, had a car club. And here she is with Byron and I'm assuming Zula driving her own car in England. And she even rode in a motorcycle. It just kills me. What, what a great lady. She certainly was a character. Victoria Woodhull died in, um, she died in 1927. And just months following that, this woman, Emily Sachs, published her biography on Victoria, and she entitled it The Terrible Siren. Self-admittedly, she was trying to get um, subscription or people to buy the book. She wanted something a bit salacious, and so she made it that way. She, as my colleague says, she cherry-picked her information. Um, unfortunately, this is the biography that stands as the seminal work. Um, and most all biographies after that are based on this one. Um, Zula was trying to get another family member to write a biography to vindicate her mother. Unfortunately, the man died before it was done. And I found the legal papers that said, well, there's already biography written about her. So um, the quintessential biography has been written. We don't need to worry about this anymore. So that is why my colleague and I have thrown all biographies out and we're going straight to the primary sources. Uh, Tenney will support the suffrage movement in the United States throughout her life, even donating a, an enormous sum to the work. So she re remained as um, someone who supported women's suffrage. Victoria was so far beyond that. That was just one part of what she advocated. 
So, um, uh, oh, and her husband, she was married to her husband, but 13 years before he died. Um, so it, it really was, Martin was her soulmate. Um, so what has happened to her? Uh, I have found this quote, John Stuart Mills, it has been said that you would never meet her and be the same afterwards. And I have to say, this is true for me. As soon as I met Victoria Woodhull, I've never been the same. And there's so much to learn about her and also so much to learn about history. What happened about all the other women, all the other people in history that got written out? To the victor goes the pen. Um, so those that don't win, why are we forgetting about them? England, they do have a cenotaph. Uh, Victoria was cremated and her ashes were scattered to her will uh, in the middle of the Atlantic between her beloved England and America. Um, so this is a cenotaph, but England has a memorial to her. What we have in the United States, only two things. That's it. We have an historical marker in Homer that's right outside the library. It's a two-sided one. I only have one picture of it. Uh, and the only memorial to her is at the Robbins Hunter Museum in Granville. It's a clock tower. Um, Robbins Hunter was an, an, an antique dealer. He renovated this clock and wanted to heroize a local hero, memorialize one, and he's the one that chose Victoria. So I'm forever grateful for that. Um, people come from all over the United States and beyond to watch this. She comes out on the hour every hour between, I think, nine and nine. Sometimes, sometimes she's a little temperamental because she's Victoria after all. So um, this is really something to see. Um, we, if you are interested, it is under construction right now, but we've got about the first third of her biographical website done, woodhullrising.org. Um, we have biographies about all her family members, everything. We've got her earlier years complete with some editing to do, but at least if you're interested, you can look at it. We have bibliographies there and we will be adding more image and image library. Um, and we also, through the Robbins Hunter Museum, have done a three-year series of roundtables based upon Victoria, not about her, but because of her. Each roundtable is about a different area of her advocacy, women's advocacy, children's advocacy, women in finance, women in politics. And so we have two more coming in the fall. And hopefully with this whole COVID crisis, we'll be able to put them virtually online. So I... Um, I recommend that you go to the Robbins Hunter Museum and check that out. Um, the last thing I wanted to show you is I found one of her quotes, therefore I feel well assured that what will be misrepresentations to which I may be subject at present, the event must be committed to time, who relentlessly unravels all distortions and rights all wrongs. So that's what we're trying to do. So. I am assuming I do this. Thank you, Dr. Dan. That was really interesting. So um, Michelle and I are back and we have a few audience questions and questions we wanted to share with um, you as we proceed here. Um, someone was asking about Victoria living in um, the Worcester area early on in her life maybe around the ages of 10 or 13 um, or in Wayne County. Do you know any information about that? I Well, we have tracked her all over the place. We've been finding city directories and any kind of census data. She lived in a lot of different places, but when she was young, it was Homer and then Mount Gilead. Uh, I know that she got married up more towards Cleveland. So kind of all around, I'm not sure, and I would have to ask my colleague of any sizable time that she spent around Wooster, but I wouldn't be surprised that she lived there. She got married in Dayton to um, blood, well, her second time. He actually hadn't, he had neglected to get divorced from his first wife. So when she and Victoria first married, so then he had to get a divorce and then they remarried. So she was always, there's always some sort of drama with Victoria, but she always righted the wrong. 
Um, here we have a question. Wonderful to hear someone so passionate about Victoria Woodhall. Can you share thoughts on her second and third bids for the presidency? Those were um, very nominal. You know, I we focus on her first bid because that was really an official bid and she was going out and advertising herself. Um, by the time her second and third bid for the presidency came out, she was living in England. So again, I think, you know, she would often say that this is, she was doing this more as a publicity stunt. She was definitely a, she would have been so into social media. She gets mm -hmm. it, she got it. And that's what she was doing. She just wanted the name out. Um, I did find a quote though that just kills me. She says, yes, though I'm only a little woman the political oligarchs who are manipulating this country for a monarchy fear me. <laughs> so she was doing it to rile some feathers. And she even said that in a number of her speeches. She says, I'm a social agitator. And she said, I'd rather be a peaceful person, but we need this. No one else has the moral courage. That's, what, that's why she was so upset with Henry Ward Beecher. She thought that he had so lacking of moral courage to stand up for his beliefs. And he admitted it. He says, yeah, I wish I had courage and I don't. Um, so yeah, she was definitely aggressive in that persona. Can you speak to her adoption of the free love movement? I'm curious about the history of that. If it's like movement that she was a part of or something that she started herself. No, she didn't start it herself. I mean, there was this whole <clears throat> kind of utopian movement, the Oneida colony and Stephen Pearl Andrews. She definitely did not come to it, but she, she embraced it in the sense that um, a woman should be able to get out of a relationship that is detrimental to her. That's what she was advocating. There's actually a very interesting book called Crossing Swords about this very thing of, um, uh, Cindy Safranoff wrote it, um, about the issue of marriage reform at the time. So she wanted women to be able to get out there. She thought it was absurd that they were living in an erudite society according to her, and we, they were still in these barbaric principles of it doesn't matter, you have to stay even to the point of going to the grave because your husband beat you. Um, so she, that's her idea of free love, that I should be able to love who I want when I want for as long as I want. It isn't kind of like the Woodstocky idea <laughs> in the streets. It's actually more of a, a, um, a religious thing, a spiritual thing. You know, you, it's so pure, love is so pure that you have to care for it. And that's, but that's kind of the problem using that phrase got her into a lot of trouble. And she said, I know it's a term, but I'm gonna stand by it. Absolutely. There's another question I'm here um, asking, why did Victoria have a falling out with other suffragists? Right, and that could be because several things. Um, one, that she was asking for too much, um, that they were looking, let's just go one thing at a time. It also can be that there was a lot of drama <laughs> broiling around Victoria always. And I think particularly for Susan B. Anthony, it was just a little too much. Susan B. Anthony really loved Victoria at the beginning and oh my gosh, she had her own money. It wasn't I'm wealthy, my husband's gonna give it. No, this is Victoria's money. So, and, and she was a mouthpiece, but they just, so much else were, was happening that I think that's how they broke apart. Um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was always her friend. Isabella Beecher, Beecher Hooker was always Victoria's friend. Um, but in the huge book on the history of woman suffrage, Stanton and Anthony left her out basically. There's one mention of her memorial. So. Thinking about reception of Woodhall and thinking about um, women who have run and if she seems kind of like an outlier and also an overlooked character in history, um, I wonder about reception and bringing up facts about crime but 
spoke. Oh. Um, there was a lot of garbling in that, so I was only picking up a few things. Right. So what I was hearing is the idea of the media perception. Is that what? Definitely. And this is one of the things that Victoria was so frustrated with is the media perception of her. And she, she even said at one point, she said, how could I have done that? I wasn't even in the city. She was such an advocate of truth and journalism that it infuriated her that things could be skewed. She was a bit of a, she could be a spin doctor, but it, it drove her nuts when other people were. And I found a quote where she said, um, I can't believe it, but the Boston papers actually got it right and and didn't spin things. So uh, yeah, her she's a victim of social media. She was a victim of sensational journalism. Um, and then I don't know what else the question is, but that just that's still the case. There's a very interesting work, a woman by the name of Terry Finneman, who writes about that. And she talks about the public persona of women who run for office um, and how certain things, you know, are pulled out. And she includes Victoria in it. So very interesting. I think I, did I catch all of that question? Yeah, I think that you did. Sorry about that. I'm no, that's here. Um, someone is asking, I think, our final question um, was about Tenney. Um, curious, was Tenney supporting NWP or NAWSA? Oh. You know what? I, I hate to not be able to answer that. I'm going to have to look that up. And I have to admit, this is one thing that I admit, Tenney is even more overlooked than Victoria. And what we're finding is Tenney is really, really important. So we are starting to look more at Tenney and I just myself haven't done it as much. So I'm afraid I can't answer that, but I know that she was always supportive of women's right to vote. I know at least both women were alive when they got the right to vote. Tenney died in, in 1923 in England. So at least they live to see that. Well, thank you for answering all of our questions here today. This is so been a great for talk. Having me. It's been really wonderful. Um, again, we will be um, adding this to our YouTube page. It will be available on Facebook. People share some of the resources to museums and books that you mentioned um, in the chat related. And again, um, please join us again on uh, July 15th on Facebook for Chris Wilson's talk. And then July 23rd, we will be on Zoom and Facebook for um, Michelle's talk on First Ladies and Suffrage. So thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And thank you so thank much, you. Dr. Dan. That was really thank wonderful. Um, and with that, we will end our broadcast for the day. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much.